you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to speak of historic opportunities lost. Uh, for an important component of our Canadian population, we see that they're being sold short. And Canadians, living Canadians and other persons living in Canada with disabilities have understandably been excited by the government's plan to bring forward C81, an act to ensure a barrier-free Canada. After years of neglect by previous governments, they were cautiously optimistic. And alas, once the media has moved on to other issues and Canadians begin to look at the fine print in this bill, they will unfortunately find a lot less to celebrate than this government would have them believe. As I've stated before on C81, this bill requires substantial amendment. And while we commend the government for tabling it, this bill will need to be altered dramatically in order to become good legislation. I committed to working with this government to provide good faith amendments so that C81 can become the historic accessibility legislation that Canada's people living with disabilities deserve. In fact, when the Minister for, Accessibil for Accessibility was asked during committee for, uh, for this bill if she'd be open to amendment, this was her response. I definitely want to see this law being the best it possibly can. I don't want to prejudge any outcomes or recommendations of the committee, but I am certainly open to hearing what you all have to say and what stakeholders have to say. Yet, over the course of eight meetings, the Standing Committee on Human Resources, Skills and Social Development and the Status of Persons with Disabilities heard from leading experts and civil society groups on the things that needed to be changed if C81 were to become good legislation. In one presentation after another, the committee heard that the bill needed implementation timelines. One such, one such expert was none other than the former Ontario Liberal, Liberal Government's minister responsible for shepherding Ontario's Accessibility Act into law. We heard again and again that all of the exemptions for obligated organizations, and uh, the bill was shot through with those, by the way, um, that these exemptions should be eliminated. We heard repeatedly that enforcement should be solely on the hands of the Accessibility Commissioner and not splintered across various organizations such as the CRTC and CTA. Groups that, as was pointed out numerous times, have a sorry record of implementing the few accessibility obligations they already have, never mind new ones. Again and again, we heard these things, but as the testimony concluded, it was as if not one had uttered a single word. Not one of these recommendations was taken up by the government. Despite what the minister clearly said, the Liberals had already decided what they were going to do. Despite this, they nevertheless expended the Treasury and witness efforts to bring experts to Ottawa to provide testimony that the government had already chosen to ignore. They ignored that excellent testimony from a former provincial Liberal minister, the highly respected Marie Boutriani, a person with actual experience implementing expansive accessibility legislation. Let's hear some of it. So here's my open air quotes. During the consultation phase, so I'm talking as Ms. Butriani now. Quotes again, sorry. During the consultation phase, we studied Great Britain's Disability Discrimination Act and were taught three critical lessons. We would need a clear deadline for an accessible Ontario. There would, be, there would need to be regulations established through which to enforce the law and public education would be key for creating awareness about the bill. 
When I was studying them, it was from their challenges. I don't want to use the word mistakes because they were pioneers. They were Great Britain, Australia, and the United States. They told me, have a timeline. Definitely have timelines. How can, how can this testimony be ignored? How can this be ignored? It's a shame. Oh, I get frustrated just thinking about it again and again because of all of the expertise and people so succinctly explaining to us what needed to be done to bolster this legislation and it's being ignored. I can't stress enough that another critical issue is the way in which C-81 splinters the power to enforce the legislation among four federal organizations, the Accessibility Commissioner, the Canadian Transportation Agency, also known as the CTA, and the CRTC, the Canadian Radio and Telecommunications Commission, and uh, the tribunal that regulates federal employment. This snarl of enforcement and administration will result in very similar regulations being en enacted by the different agencies involved, rather than by one single agency. The duplication will not just risk inconsistencies, it will create them, causing even further delays. The predictable result, the real possibility that some sectors of the economy will have these regulations ready for them before other sectors. This bill should be looking to eliminate the interdepartmental patchwork system that's already in place, rather than making it more complex. After all, that is the purpose of national strategies, of national legislation, which this is supposed to be fulfilling. Again, the splintered formula is a confusion. And the government's response was to say this, um, and it, it boggles the mind. So again, the quote starts. Uh, this was from the government representative uh, that's on record as giving testimony. So the quote starts. We'll have a policy that there will be no wrong door. Whichever agency you go to, no matter how confusing it is to figure it out, we will, and believe me, it is confusing if you go in the wrong door. We'll send you, we'll send the complaint to the right door, problem solved, end quote. Once again, there's not really a clear understanding by the government of the lived reality of people living with disabilities having to advocate for themselves and access these so-called doors. The purpose of the Accessibility Commissioner is laid out right for us. This should be perfect synergy, and the government has chosen to ignore that, unfortunately. And as pointed out by the esteemed David Lepofsky, who has been mentioned in this chamber already by my honorable colleague, the, uh, David Lepofsky is the chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians Disabilities Act Alliance. And he says, he points out that the problem isn't solved at all because it does not fix the matter of which door you do go in. It doesn't solve the substantial problem that happens once you're inside that door. It means we have to lobby four agencies to get them up to the necessary level of expertise. It means we have to learn four different sets of procedures it means we have to go to agencies that have little to no expertise in disability and accessibility. This would be the expertise we envisioned that an accessibility commissioner would be fulfilling. And this is what all of these organizations and advocacy groups and experts with lived experience in the community as a person living with a different ability, they understood that an accessibility commissioner was going to achieve this very basic sentiment that they had because they're worn out from having to advocate. And for us as bureaucrats, 
it would have been the one-stop shop. It would have been cleaner. From a bureaucratic perspective, this would have been a lot cleaner to give one concise responsibility to this new accessibility commissioner. But no, we're going to hold them back and there's going to be four different ways that it's going to be approached. And oh, this isn't your territory, but this is. It's, uh, it's just inviting more and more chaos. And um, I, I just want to go back to the fact that it makes far more sense to simply mandate the new accessibility commissioner with all the accessibility enforcement under this act. The design of this bill, which establishes the splintering among agencies, only serves two interests. And the first is protecting bureaucratic turf, and the second is easing back on the expectations on obligated organizations um, so that they can have weaker standards, slower implementation, and flimsy enforcement. Um, that's not consistent <coughs> with the federal government's commendable mo motivations and intentions under this legislation. It isn't. It doesn't make sense. It's not consistent. And so today, um, before I heard my honorable colleague across the way table his amendment, I had anticipated that I would be at the end of my speech tabling an amendment. But for the record, I will explain what it is um, with the time that I have remaining. Um, but just so that all Canadians who are uh, listening and following this understand that there was a last plea made, a last ditch effort made by both parties in the opposition to revisit C81 and actually give it some teeth. Um, yes, and so today in, an, in a last, last ditch effort to try and help C81 become the kind of bill the government professes it to be, but which it clearly isn't, um, I've offered a good faith amendment that is actually about uh, implementing timelines and having uh, enforcement uh, so we could go back to the committee and actually look at implementing those timelines and um, eliminating exemptions would be another one that I would see that we need to do. Um, of course, I expect the government to reject uh, any such amendment um, just as it rejected the nearly uh, 120 other ones brought forward to the committee in complete good faith by opposition parties. Um, but I wanted to take this last chance to do the right thing and to be on the record doing so. The NDP has long been committed to the rights of persons with disabilities, and in fact, it's been our long-standing position that all of government every budget, every policy, every regulation, every grant should be viewed through a disability lens. Our ultimate goal has always been to help foster a society in which all of our citizens are able to participate fully and equally. We believe this cannot even begin to happen until all of our institutions are open and completely accessible to everyone. In fact, the NDP has supported the establishment of a Canadians with a Disabilities Act for many years, and the call for a CDA can be found in our 2015 platform. And that uh, language is very important, a Canadians with Disabilities Act. We believe that any accessibility bill tabled by the government should essentially be enabling legislation for Canada's obligations to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Canada ratified this convention in 2010, and a Canadians with Disabilities Act would be consistent language in implementing this convention. Until now, Canada has done nothing to bring our laws into conformity with uh, the convention. And in fact, I tabled a motion in this very chamber, M56, that called on the government to implement these obligations. The, the convention sets out the legal obligations on states to promote and protect the rights of people with disabilities. It does not create new rights. There are a number of principles and articles within the CRPD that are extremely important to people with disabilities. And these principles address rights such as the ability to live independently, 
freedom from exploitation and violence, the right to an adequate standard of living, social protections, and more. Rather than considering disability an issue of medicine, of charity, or of dependency, the Convention challenges people worldwide to understand disability as a human rights issue. It establishes that discrimination against any person on the basis of disability is a violation of the rights, inherent dignity, and worth of the human person. The Convention covers many areas where obstacles can arise, such as physical access to buildings, roads and transportation, access to information through written and electronic communications. The Convention also aims to reduce stigma and discrimination, which are often reasons why people with disabilities are excluded from education, employment, and health and other services. It is important here to note that the Convention is our ideal. It is up to governments to bridge the distance between these ideals and the lived reality of people with disabilities. And one such bridge is supposed to be C81. That is the bridge we debate here today. A major lapse on the part of the government is that it did not include language in C81 requiring, requiring all federal government laws, policies, and programs to be studied through a disability lens. In other words, it is not language that is in keeping with our obligations under the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So we would still need more legislation to bridge that gap, which we anticipated we were closing. Now we have a step that is basically a false gesture in doing that. Um, one of the things I wanted to uh, really go into is that this disability law lens is a strange omission because we find it hard to, on the ground, create a lived reality of all of us developing, pol developing policy, developing legislation, are not using that disabilities lens. And one way that the di disability lens can be used for analyzing public policy is um, to make sure is to ask, does the policy view disabled people as members of a minority group with special needs, or does it view disability as one of many variables in the population, and thus aim to structure society so as to ensure universal access and coverage, which is an extremely, this is such a profound aspect of what our accessibility legislation needs to be able to do. And therefore, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, in uh, seeing the time, and I'm kind of improvising a little bit here because my understanding of our procedure is that once an amendment has been tabled, I can't do another one. But I would just like people to have a general idea of the text of my uh, what my amendment would have sounded like, and even though it is very similar to my honourable colleagues. Um, and this amendment is my last plea on behalf of people with disabilities and those of us who care about them for us to go back and get C81 right. I would have moved that, and seconded by everybody who wants to be a seconder now, I would have moved that the motion be amended by deleting all the words after the word that and substituting the following. Bill C-81, an act to ensure a barrier-free Canada be not read now a third time, but be referred back to the Standing Committee on Human Resources, Skills and Social Development and the Status of Persons with Disabilities for the purpose of eliminating exemptions for obligated organizations and including implementation timelines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.